Ready to go? Yeah. Cool. I'm always, do you have a booger fear? I yeah. always have fear of having a booger on my I have fear of having things in my teeth. Oh. I didn't even think about that until now. No. <laughs> Add it to <laughs> the list. Add it to the list. To my list. Yeah. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the third episode of What Makes a Maker. I am in San Francisco right now with my friend Simone Yech. We're in your new shop. Uh huh. Well, is it still new? It's a year almost, right? Mm, I think like eight months. Oh, okay. Or something so like that. It, it's newish. Enough for there to be a solid cover of dust <laughs> on all, all the things. Okay. It looks great. So we met maybe two and a half years ago, and ever since then we worked on a couple projects. I think it all started with a dog walking robot. That was mm -hmm. a super spontaneous project. Followed by an even more spontaneous project, the Pussy Grabs Back robot. Yeah, because Donald Trump got elected and we were both feeling frustrated. Yes. That's the quickest I've ever turned yeah. around a project because I think like from idea to having a video published was like 24 hours or something like oh, that. Oh, yeah, and the build was maybe like three hours or something. Yeah, we made it so fast. Yeah, yeah. and my friend uh, skipped in and yeah. came, uh, came to the shoot. <laughs> <laughs> and, and donated uh, his crotch, his crotch, and yeah. pain. So after that, um, what was after that? Was it the tampon dispenser? And then we kind of collaborated on your wall mural. I helped yeah, you paint helped the it out. Your boots. Yeah. And then we worked on a super secret project that we still can't talk about, but we're going to announce it hopefully soon. Oh, that's the... The, the January project? Uh-huh. The and beep! <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. And now we're working on a, a super secret project again. Great content. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I always Can hate you... myself when I have to be like, oh my god, I have a really secret yeah. thing that I'm so excited about announcing. And then you're like, oh no, I'm that person Can now. you tease a little? Like, can you, is there like a little Ooh, crumb? We're working on a car. Yeah, Ex both the things have been working on cars. Right. Yeah, we've right. rebuilt cars in very different ways. Very different. Yeah, two car projects back to back. I cannot wait till you guys see what we're working on and what we have been working on in January. It is so nice, it's so cool. Yeah. I wanted to ask you something, um, because this shop is quite, quite new, we established that. Yeah. Uh, and a comment that I, get almost on a daily basis is if I had a shop like you and all these fancy tools I could I could build these things and I think you are living proof that that's just not true like that statement is Wait, not true because I have all the fancy tools but no. I can't build the things that you're building <laughs> no that's a shame Laura no. <laughs> is that a language barrier I guess you're, you're living proof that even if you have fancy tools you can't build as great things as I do no, what I mean is like you just moved into this shop and you built your career out of a teeny tiny shop that's basically a desk in your yeah. house. Yeah, I mean, in the start, I barely had any tools at yeah. all and I feel like that's so much. I mean, and something that's kind of unfortunate with being a maker that it's just, it's such a like gear sport. Yeah, that's true. Of like just accumulating all of this equipment that enables you to do the things, but it's also like, I mean, I feel like you can do things with pretty small means. I, I built some pretty big projects like in my tiny backyard. Yeah, um, true. And it was definitely not ideal, but you kind of make it work. So now having this bigger space, are you building bigger stuff? Like what, how does your thinking change or did it change anything at all? Yeah, I mean, I think you're always like, thinking of projects and ideas that's within the scope of your skills and the space that you're in and the tool sets that you have. Like the turtle that grows as big as the aquarium is? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. 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 Um, and I, I think, and, and that's like also one of the things I really liked with building things with other people is that they have a completely different range of skill sets yeah. and like building stuff with, for example, Marcos, um, who's, who's been helping me out with a few projects like he approaches problems in such a different way for me and that's yeah. the same with you like I remember when we were building the tampon dispenser my first response was like oh we should like do CAD design and 3d print something laser cut something and you're like no nah, let's do metal working and I'm like no <laughs> we so underestimated that project right yeah uh, it will be done in a day <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the three I think it took three days. Yeah. But it, I, at three times. 
three times the amount you estimate is pretty yeah, accurate it's for pretty most accurate. Project That's projects. True. Now remember what I wanted to ask you or comment on. You said that you wouldn't call yourself an artist. Yeah. I am super shy about that as well. It feels like it's something you don't give yourself your own nickname. Like you don't choose a nickname yeah. for yourself. And People you call, call me it. Mad Dog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I feel like the only time I would maybe dare to call myself an artist is because it explains a lot to people yeah in the sense that like I'm doing things for the sake of doing things yeah I feel like that's kind of what, what you mean when you say that you're an artist because when I say like oh I'm an inventor or I'm an engineer people are always like oh like what type are you doing work for other people or mm -hmm. things like that and when you say you're an artist you're just like oh you're just like a messy creative person. I really like Inventor. I saw it uh, on a badge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I really like Inventor. I it's, like it too. It's whimsical. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it makes me feel like a cartoon character. I, yep. I tend to say Inventor and YouTuber. Yeah. What do you say? I thought about it and I think maybe like professional beginner might be a cool, <laughs> might be a cool term. <laughs> That's a good company name. Yeah. Professional beginners. I claimed it. Yeah. You heard it? <laughs> no, that's great. I like it. Or like a or like a tool brand or yeah. something like that. Because it's like really easy, intuitive tools, but like professional grade that's and true. will last you a lifetime. That's true. And, and I think that's a huge ad aspect of what I do, at least, is just try something for the first time and see how it works out. Yeah. And then not... Because if you're a professional at something, like a, like a real pro, and you know all the ins and outs and all the things where it might get tricky and how expensive projects can get and how difficult it is, like you would never start it or I would never start it. Mm. So I like the beginner's mindset of, oh yeah, of course I can build a helicopter made of straws. It would be fine, you know? And then you, you, you yeah, have to you figure it of, out. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I feel like the majority of the projects I've started, I would not have started if I would have understood how difficult yeah. it would be. Yeah. But then you kind of get through it what somehow. Was, what was the most difficult thing, except the project we're working on right now? I feel mm. like that's a peak. <laughs> yeah, that was a really difficult one. Um, I think that actually the first like proper electronics project that I did, because mm -hmm. I um, had this idea that I wanted to make an iPhone case with retractable guitar strings. <laughs> So you could like hold the cord on the screen and yeah. you could pull out guitar strings and snap them to your belt and play oh. the guitar. And th this was when I was in advertising school and I collaborated on the project with a guy named Jonathan. And we, it was so complicated I because like I did, I did all the electronics. He did some of the CAD design for the case and like just, designing the mechanism like a seat belt kind of mechanism yeah. of pulling out and like having tension of what is it like six guitar strings yeah and then like measuring the capacitive touch in the guitar string to see if they were being plucked sending that over bluetooth low energy to the phone and like i had to program an iphone app for the first time and like wow. see where you're holding your fingers and stuff like that but like some fucking way you got it together like we it got worked? it together and it worked yeah but that was the first electronics project I did, and I think the only reason wow. that I started it was because I had no idea how complicated it was going to be. But it was a super yeah. fun prototype and like proof of concept, yeah. and it actually worked. And I think that there would probably be ways to make it work, but mm -hmm. then other things happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's also the the mindset of not committing to this one project and dealing with patents and all these things for yeah. every idea that you have but being able to let it go and go like yeah it's a cool proof of concept i had a lot of fun but right now i'm interested in something else i think that's that's a, that is so nice to jump from idea to idea and not be married with every idea that you have but i think that's the mindset that's kind of led us to these jobs mm -hmm. that we have because i also remember i was like i love building things i love electronics I definitely don't want to work on the same product for seven years. Yeah, yeah. I like want to make one or two prototypes yes. and then move on. Yeah. And then you're like, in what magical world is that a job? Yeah. And that magical world was YouTube. YouTube. Yeah. yeah. I remember sitting in um, the first workshop that I had, I was still studying design and I was tinkering around with a prototype for some class. I don't remember what it was. And my friend, she had the same class, so we were both working on it and we pulled an all-nighter and had a couple beers and we we're talking about like, can you imagine like where we would be in five years? And I was so frustrated at the time because I couldn't, 
imagine any job. Like I couldn't see anything that would work for me. So I told her like, I just want to be in my shop, play with stuff and have somebody pay me for that. <laughs> And she's like, yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I totally forgot about it. She wrote me a letter like a year ago. Like, do you remember you said that? And and now that's kind of what it is. Like, yeah. yeah, just being able to play and building prototypes. It's so nice. Yeah. yeah. What was the first investment you made in yourself? Like either buying something or giving you the allowance to do something? To explain this, um, when I start, when I made my first YouTube video, I, I realized how much I like it. And I was already self-employed. And then I decided I will give myself, I think it was six months to figure this out and just commit six months of my life to just making videos. And if it works, it works. And if it not works, then I at least have a very elaborate portfolio of things that I would do if yeah. nobody paid me and I would just be on my own. That was my first investment in myself, I think. I, do you have a moment there? Yeah, I think for me, everything kind of coincided because I was living in San Francisco and I was an intern at a company as a maker in residence. Mm -hmm. So my, because I was like, I got really interested in electronics and I was considering going back to school for it. But then I was like, what if I could get a job that would like pay me to learn about this? So I managed to get a job with one project in my portfolio that was the guitar project as a maker in residence at this um, Arduino company, uh, or they had a board that was Arduino based. So I was just coming off of that. I had published the toothbrush helmet and the breakfast machine that were things I just built on the side. And they had both done really well online. And my visa expired and we tried to like extend it, but it didn't work out. So I was moving back home to Sweden. And that was when I was like, I'm just gonna try to spend, like give myself a few months and spend time on only doing things I find interesting. Yeah. And I moved home with my mom. I tried to like live as frugally as possible and just allow myself, like really value my time and what I spent my time on and mm -hmm. just allowing myself to explore these like shitty robots and the topics that I was interested in. So I think that was the main investment and what kind of kickstarted everything and I mean that's such a privilege to be able to like move home to your mom and do that and spend that time yeah. but it was so fast I think it was like four or five months after I published the first video that I actually managed to work full-time mm -hmm. with my channel mm -hmm. but it was very much because I was like I'll do freelance and I'm at some consulting and I like give workshops or stuff like that yeah. but that just like very quickly got pushed aside because YouTube was just taking over everything yeah Thank God. Yeah. So last question always is, what do you think makes a maker? So I realized like it was in that time period when I was applying for a visa or mm -hmm. trying to stay in the States, one of the things, so I was trying to ex uh, apply for an extraordinary ability visa uh, because that was the only one where you didn't have to have a degree which I didn't have, so I was like, I'll try to have an extraordinary ability. And one of the things was you need to be published, or you, like, you need to have published works and all of these uh, magazines that are in your field. So I tried to write an article with that exact title for Make Magazine. The title was, was What Makes a Maker? What Makes a Maker, no yeah. And I actually found it on my computer. What? Because it's like, What Makes a Maker? So this document was created 2015, so this was like, right in the beginning. I think I maybe published a toothbrush helmet and a breakfast machine, mm -hmm. but nothing else. Okay, so blah, 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 blah. The question in the title of this article has probably been asked a thousand times. And if you allow slight variations, millions of times. What makes an entrepreneur? What makes a good parent? What makes an athlete? What makes me who I am? Oh gosh, I, I should just give another TED talk and only just do all of this. Since about a year back, I work as a professional maker. Yes, that is an actual thing. Humble, Simone. <laughs> <laughs> During that time, I have met various makers, everything from your regular, wow, I just made some stuff blink, to people who get an idea and actually take it into production. And in this eclectic collection of people, I have identified two main character traits. The first of them is curiosity. What happens if I put a piece of Lego in the toaster? How can I make a warning system for if my turtle is flipped over? <laughs> Did you have a turtle? Solid like part. No, I've never had a turtle. <laughs> I don't even know a turtle. The second one is grit. 
because many people have ideas, great ideas even, but not everyone has the grit to go through with it and actually build it. Curiosity grit. It's good. I we kind of agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Curiosity, grit, lack of humility, because you're just like, I think I could do that. Yeah. And then you kind of get through it. Yeah. And not being too precious about things. Yeah. Like, I feel like if you're super worried about how you're going to perform and do th something, like, then you're never going to start. Yeah. So people are just kind of like, oh, whatever it becomes, it's kind of okay. Yeah. So you got to be okay with leaving your comfort zone and just try, try shit. Yeah, really like being okay with things getting a little bit dirty or a little bit broken or yeah, just not being too precious about things. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank did you. Did the test? I think you did. Yeah. They will let us know. Oh no. <laughs> did I pass? Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Oh, thanks um, for coming to San Francisco for Super Secret Car Project. Super Secret Car Project. Yeah, we're heading there right now. I. <sighs> Again, like I cannot wait to brag about this. Like I'm, I'm only a teeny tiny part of this. Like I just a teeny tiny part, and I'm so proud to be oh. here. Thank you so much. I just hope it will be worth bragging about in the end. It, it will be. I am. I have no doubt in my mind. We'll see. Cool. Thank you guys for watching, and uh, thank you for having me. Well, thanks for being here. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. This week's video is brought to you by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creators with more than 2,500 classes in design, business, and much, much more. Usually the membership costs around 10 bucks per month, but Skillshare is giving away a free two month unlimited access trial for the first 500 people who click the link in the description. I am about to launch a podcast with my friend Melanie Rabe about the ins and outs of being self-employed in a creative industry. This is why I took the class, How to Make a Podcast by John Lagomazzino. Take a look. The technical barrier to podcasting has really never been lower. If you've ever shot a video on your phone and uploaded that to YouTube, you're more than prepared to make a podcast. In today's class, we're gonna go through all the steps that you need to do to start your podcast. And that means ideation, recording, editing and mixing, distributing and promoting the show. I'm John Lago Marcino. I'm a podcaster and Anchor's head of production. I'm excited that you joined the class. Let's get started. If this is something you might be interested in, go ahead and click the link in the description and check the platform out for yourself. I want to thank Skillshare for the ongoing support of my work. And I want to thank you guys for watching. And I will see you next week with a new video. Bye.